Last episode, we were introduced to the world of Avalon. It has the looks and ruling systems of a medieval English society, but with advanced technology like genetic engineering, holographic armor, glowing weapons, and hoverboats. We were also introduced to the Heron Dynasty of the West and its ruling family, including the youngest, Prince Ethan, and his sidekick, a member of the genetically engineered lesser races named Skink. Gifted, or cursed, by a stranger with a mysterious red and yellow sigil, Ethan accidentally scarred the heir of the Raven Dynasty, a man named Braun. Surrendering himself to the Ravens in order to prevent war, Ethan and Skink were imprisoned in the Raven dungeons, Braun slashed Ethan's face, and then they were freed. Ethan now wakes inside of a beautiful forest. His face has been healed somehow, and his benefactor stands revealed before him. She's mysterious, she's gorgeous, and she is Ashley. And I am Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown, episode 18.2, Scion, The Underground. Since the discovery of Ethan's escape, in order to find him has gone out through the Raven Keep. As we open issue 3, a thin member of the lesser races runs to find Prince Braun with an update. This boy is thin, with pale green skin. He wears a brown vest, blue pants, and worn leather boots. Curling black tattoos decorate his bald head, highlighting his small gray eyes. The boy finds Braun standing at an indoor balcony. Brilliant sunlight pours through a painstakingly rendered set of windows. I can practically feel the warm sun on me when I look at this page, but it brings no peace to the prince. The boy reports that the whole of the keep has been searched, but they have found no sign of the escaped prince. The search has been expanded into the surrounding countryside, but they still have no clue how Ethan escaped either. Does the master have any other instructions? There's a quiet pause. Master? Braun terms, aiming his scarred eye at the boy. There is no eye patch covering it now. How incompetent can they all be? He's one boy! Braun grabs the boy by his vest so that he can shout right in his face, and then he throws him back and away. The boy lands face first on the floor. Ready my steed and my hounds, Braun orders. It seems he must do everything himself. And stay out of my sight! He adds as the boy runs out of the room, making sure to nervously bow as he passes by the Raven King. The King and Prince then talk. It's clear the King holds Braun responsible for Ethan's escape. When Braun remarks about it, his father replies, How frustrating for you. But then he says that this might be the excuse they were looking for. They have been wanting to draw the Herons into war for some time, and now they finally have a good reason. Why... They almost owe Prince Ethan a thank you. Braun looks away. He'll deliver his thanks personally. Ooh, I did not remember this scene at all last episode. No, I did not. The Ravens were not posturing an issue, too. Their goal was to go to war. That was, that was a bad misread on my part. Otherwise, this scene serves to restate our status quo and reinforce Braun's personality. He's not just angry. The king comments that, quote, his son's foul mood is justified for once, end quote. Braun is always prickly, moody, and foul-tempered just by nature. Ethan, and now this boy, are just the most recent victims of his personality. In contrast, his father is calm and collected, looking to the raven's larger concerns while Braun rages about a personal slight. And sweet Kirby crackle the artwork here! The architecture, the line work, the details, the lighting, flooping A this book is pretty. I always forget how just gorgeous this is. It's like, like the sunlight brings no warmth to this place at all, but you can still feel the sunlight. I can practically feel the chill in the air around my feet as I squint through the bright lights. It's great. Chung, Hillsman, and Rodriguez flooping crush the looks of this book. Good God. 
Anyways, we return to Ethan and Skink only a few moments after Ashley's introduction. Still dumbstruck and confused, Ethan approaches her. She unties something from her horse's saddle and then tosses it to Ethan. He unwraps it and finds his tournament sword. Then he recognizes her. She was the woman in the dungeon. Ashley watches him carefully, saying only that she has friends inside the keep. She then orders him to follow her. Securing his sword and scabbard around his waist, Ethan does so. He asks if she's the one who freed him. He was in danger, she answers coolly, confirming nothing. And I mean, that's a good point, he says. But Ethan kind of surrendered himself for a reason? With him escaped from the dungeons, they may have just endangered the peace of their two nations. Ashley scowls at him. There are bigger problems at hand than those of the dynasties. Ethan just wants to figure out his problems? Thank you, those are hard enough right now. He rolls up his sleeve, exposing the sigil. Like this thing. He still isn't sure where it came from or what it means, and then there's the missing scar on his face? How did that heal? Ashley leads him to a small crevice in a large rock wall. She has no clue what he's talking about. Now come on, follow her. And keep quiet. A short distance in, the pair find themselves standing on a rocky outcropping. They overlook a large, multi-leveled cavern. Massive structural pylons hold the stone ceiling up. Large, glowing blue-white lights are set throughout the cavern, illuminating the area. Dozens of workers are on the floor, moving stone or pushing carts that are filled with, check this out, stone. We can see that one of them gets grabbed by a raven guard, who holds a glowing yellow rod over his victim. Another few guards float nearby on platforms, overseeing all. Ethan, who had trouble actually staying quiet up to this point, pestering Ashley with questions, is finally rendered speechless. Ashley quietly explains, This is how the lesser races are worked here in the East. Trapped in caverns, worked until they dropped, just to be replaced by another one. It could easily be in the fields, though, or factories. It's all the same. They made the lesser races to be a new kind of person, but now they're viewed as less than a person. You're saying that they're... they're... Ethan can't even say the word. They're slaves, Ashley says. As the camera moves in, we do see collars around the worker's neck, with cylinders plugged into the back of them, their purpose unclear. Ethan can't believe it. Even in the West, they've never done this to their members of the lesser races. No, they just do the things that you think are beneath you, Ashley says. But it doesn't change the fact that the lesser races are treated as less than in either country. Ashley is part of a movement to change all that, but they need a figurehead in the West. Given Ethan's choice of second in the tournament, meaning Skink, she thought that he might be willing to join them. The Underground could use him. Ethan isn't sure what she thinks that he can do, but before they can do anything else, a cry of pain catches their attention. On the floor of the cavern, one of the guards prepares to hit a member of the lesser races with his staff. The child's parent rushes forward to protect them and the guard twists, shocking the parent instead. Ethan stands up quickly. They can't let this happen. But Ashley claps a hand over his mouth and holds him back. No, this is not the time to act. They need to get out of here before a search party finds their horses and skink. The pair head back the way that they came and are soon back inside the rocky forest. Once a safe distance away, Ethan says that he isn't sure what she expects him to do now. Well, does he have any doubts about her mission? Quite frankly, that's... That's just so far past Ethan's current concerns. Like, he has had his whole life upended in the past few days. And he then summarizes the events of our past two issues. And now she wants him to join some kind of underground rebellion? He'd like to figure out his mess before he starts to dive into a whole new one. His response trails off, though, as they approach the clearing where they had left Skink. And Skink is not alone. A trio of bounty hunters are now there, two ladies and a dude. One of the women rides a flooping griffin while the man is on top of a large lizard steed, and Skink is shackled behind him. They recognize who Ethan is instantly, so he turns to Ashley looking for help, but she's gone. <sighs> great. Cool. That's great. Ethan draws his sword and charges. 
With two strikes, he manages to unseat the rider, hop into the saddle, and then floop in book it. Skink asks after Ashley, but Ethan has no good answer as to where she went. Can Skink get those manacles off? They need to get gone. Before they can, though, the pair round a corner and find themselves at the side of a shallow river, which ends in a waterfall. And on the other side of the river is Prince Braun and a hunting party. Braun sits on top of a large scarlet lion beast and he holds a thick chain which connects to the collar of a large wolf. It's pretty badass. You saved me the trouble of hunting you down, Braun says. How thoughtful. Oh, and you've healed your scar, I see, adding insult to Braun's already insulted injury. He then threatens war between their nations due to Ethan's escape. Despite the rather unfortunate circumstances of all of this, Ethan sheathes his sword. He beat Braun in fair combat once before, hinting that he could do so again if he needed to, but he also says that he will gladly surrender in order to avoid war. He is willing to honor the original deal. He did not intend to escape. That's a real shame, Braun says. It's too bad that, after Ethan escaped, the Ravens never managed to find him again. The only option they have left to satisfy their wounded pride, will be to demand satisfaction on the battlefield. Braun then releases his wolf, telling Reaver that Ethan is his. Ethan, a now-freed skink, okay, I guess he was able to get those manacles off, uh, abandon their steed and start moving to their left up another stone incline. They scramble quickly, but Reaver is close behind, nipping at their heels. A smaller waterfall blocks them from going any further once they round the ridge, forcing Ethan to turn, draw his sword, and face the beast. Ethan tucks Skink behind him, but suddenly the wolf's attention is elsewhere. Behind Ethan is Ashley, and she holds her hands out to the wolf. Reaver calmly pads over to her, and she kneels down, petting him, letting him lick her face. Yes, she missed him too, she says. Now run along. The wolf does so, and Ethan is just flooping dumbfounded. How did you do that? Ashley smiles. Animals like her. Then she gets serious, and the smile disappears. There are about to be a dozen angry ravens down there once Reaver gets back. They need to go. If Ethan is joining her. Ethan still thinks that his first priority needs to be his stuff. There is a war brewing here no matter what he does now. He needs to get home. He's got a responsibility to his family. What about Skink? Ashley asks. Isn't he part of your family? Well, that gives Ethan pause. He looks at his friend, asking what Skink thinks about all this. Skink shakes his head, though. He cannot help Ethan decide his path here. His decision needs to be his. Ethan thinks for a long moment, his face shadowed in the setting sun. When he looks up, Ethan's expression is set. He can't help her. Not yet. His duty is to his family. He has to go home first. Disappointed, Ashley pulls a small green gem off of her choker. She hoped that he would prove to have more substance than that. But maybe someday he will. Ashley hands him the gem. This will lead him to the underground, to her, if he ever changes his mind. Ethan apologizes for letting her down. Ashley brushes it off, instead telling him that there's a passage behind the waterfall. He needs to get moving. After all, he's a wanted man. As Ashley leaves, Ethan and Skink move behind the waterfall, and in moments, they're gone. The camera then starts to pull out, turning green and then displaying targeting reticles. Standing some distance away on a rocky ridge, a large muscular figure has been watching. Two large double-bladed axes are locked into a holding mechanism on his back. Details of his form are obscured by a large, tattered blue cloak that whips in the wind. This figure pulls down their telescope. Easy money. So we've got a couple of things going on here, but easily the most important thing to come out of this issue is Ashley and the Underground. I mentioned last episode that the advanced technology of Avalon doesn't really get played around a lot. It hasn't changed society 
almost at all, as everything still looks and feels medieval, but they also have glowing lights or hovering boats now. The main reason for the technology in the story, though, is that it allows for the creation of the lesser races, and the question that their existence now poses to Ethan. Despite the fact that the lesser races were created in order to do the manual labor or the dangerous work that humanity didn't want to do, should they have to do it? After all, isn't freedom the right of all sentient beings? Don't these people deserve self-determination in their own fates? I mean, yes. You don't have to think too hard about that. And this is one of the interesting things that Mars poses to Ethan. He doesn't offer Ethan a choice between doing something that feels right but is evil, like, say, killing a mob boss. In a Punisher comic book, you would expect the mob boss to get killed. That's what the Punisher does. But killing is still illegal, and it is still amoral. In a Daredevil comic, you might expect Daredevil to be standing over the body of a badly beaten mob boss, debating whether or not it's more evil to let him live and maybe cause more pain. Or is it evil to kill him? These are clear choices between good and evil, but the story is built in such a way that the evil choice is appealing. But Mars proposes a far harder question to answer in this series, by giving Ethan two goods to choose from. Helping his family, preparing for war, fighting as part of a war that he accidentally set in motion, those are all good things, and they are all the morally right thing to do. But so is helping the lesser races. So what do you do now? How do you choose between the lesser of two goods? And that's one of the things that I like best about all of CrossGen's books. There aren't very many anti-heroes. This isn't a company about guys like Venom or Spawn and their need to kill or murder in order to do good deeds. This is a company that wants to focus on heroic fiction, exploring what makes a good person a good person. For each of their books, we are going to have different types of people in completely different societies, all wrestling with new powers and the effect that it has on their lives and ultimately their worlds. These are stories about good people trying to do the best thing possible, and that is impossible all of the time. You have to do the best thing you can at the time and keep on doing that. And so ultimately, here, we see Ethan side with his family. Because let's face it, even though Ethan treats Skink better than the rest of his family, Ethan has still grown up with the expectation that the lesser races do the work. That's just how it is. He even argues with Ashley a bit. We don't work them like slaves in the West, and Ashley calls him out on it. No, you don't, but you don't treat them like equals, either. You're doing good, but you can do better. You should be doing better. But one thing at a time. Ethan's family is in danger, and he has to go home before he can do anything else. And that's the right thing to do, too. I'm very glad that Ethan at least tried to surrender himself back to the Ravens. Like, it would have been so stupid to have him surrender, then be kidnapped into accidentally escaping, and then have the choice of staying or going, and have him actually choose to flee, knowing that the war would have been on the horizon. So, I'm glad that he was at least willing to surrender, even if Braun wasn't willing to take him up on it. And what an a-hole, right? This is one of the things that I actually really appreciate about Braun. He is unapologetically a jerk. I don't want your surrender, I want war. So we'll kill you here, claim you escaped, and then kill your family anyway. Screw you, kid. That's solid bad guy -osity. And... He rides a flooping battle cat. That's dope. We see so many cool creatures in this, uh, between Ethan's lizard mount, the griffin, and the battle cat. And actually, I'm a bit annoyed that we lose the griffin so quickly. I get that Ethan knocked the lizard rider off and then he booked it, but griffins have giant wings on their back. They can floop and fly. Why wasn't that bird in the air like some kind of helicopter, hmm? Like... Yeah, we've got an escaped prisoner fleeing on foot, driving a light yellow lizard, four-legged with a single passenger. He's heading towards the river. Repeat, he is heading towards the river. All units converge. This is the kind of change that advanced technology should allow for, right? 
How has this world mastered genetic engineering and holograms, but they haven't discovered radio waves? I love you, Crossgen, but even I have to admit, that's kind of dumb world building. Then, here at the end of the book, we have Ashley appearing and disappearing and disarming Reaver with her charms. Clearly, this woman is more than she seems. She has access to the Raven Keep, she is familiar with their hunting dogs, she has access to either money or technology, as shown by her tracking beacon necklace thing. But is she a servant who just has some good connections? Is she a princess, or some kind of ally of the Ravens, or what? No one's mentioned any other Raven kids at this point in the story, so it's possible she's a member of the royal family, but she's very careful not to mention any details of her personal life. And that's one of the things that I love the most about her in this issue. She isn't played as a love interest at all. Like, this is a young man's fantasy world, right? We have got a young man out in the world by himself for the first time. He's behind enemy lines. He's got the fate of his home and his family riding on him. He's got this weird mark on his arm. This is the point in the story where he would meet a stunning woman who falls for him, and by extension for us as the audience, who then acts as his ally. But Ashley specifically dodges the first group of bounty hunters. She's not quite rude, but she is certainly curt with Ethan and dismissive of his problems. Ethan's concerns are not her concerns. She has better and bigger things to do, and I really appreciate that. It makes Ashley feel more like her own character and not just a part of Ethan's story. Skink, in contrast, feels like he's here as part of Ethan's story, but he doesn't really have anything going on with him other than his story with Ethan, while Ashley is a world unto herself. I actually think that it's particularly interesting that Skink doesn't weigh in on the lesser race's predicament at all. He has been shown to be loyal to Ethan, so he clearly cares about him, and he has been supportive emotionally. But he doesn't say one thing or another about the lesser race's status. Is Skink happy as Ethan's nursemaid slash guardian? It would certainly seem so. Does Skink loving his job mean that every other member of the lesser races must suffer as slaves, though? Skink encourages Ethan to make his own decisions, regardless of how he feels about it, and that is very self-sacrificing. It's suspiciously self-sacrificing. I also have never gotten why Ethan can't do both objectives. Ashley straight up says that the Underground needs a leader in the West. So why wouldn't Ethan just accept her offer, get the Underground's aid to return to the West, defend his family and their lands, and then make reforms? He would be a war hero at this point, the guy who warned the West of the Raven's intentions. Wouldn't that give him some political clout to demand that the lesser races be granted autonomy? You could even pull a little American Civil War action and offer to accept any lesser race member who turned on the Ravens as a Heron citizen. If the Raven lands run on the slave force of the lesser races, you could cripple their military force by removing them easily. But I understand that, that is a lot for one story to do in 22 pages, even if those 22 pages are god blessed glorious. Chung's landscapes look great, his fight scenes are fluid and easy to follow, the pages are detailed and colorful, like, I will never be able to talk about how pretty this book is because it is just so well done. Artistically, Scion is like a 12 out of 10, easily. I won't lie, from a writing perspective, this is solid work, it's a good read, but it is not blowing my mind either. I would give the writing here a solid mm, 7 or an 8 out of 10. It is not bad, by any stretch of the imagination, but it isn't doing anything to blow my mind, and like I said, we've got a little bit of world-building things that I have problems with. But I can stare at these pages all day. Oh, I love it. Having escaped from his enemies, for now, things don't get easier for Ethan and Skink as they continue their journey in the Ravenlands. As we open issue 4, it's nighttime, and our boys have prepared to bed down for the night in the ruins of an abandoned castle. They quickly discover that they aren't alone. Another group of bounty hunters have found them. Ethan attacks them carefully, shattering a spear shaft, slicing a shoulder muscle, disarming another person. 
He buys enough time for Skink to run past them, and Ethan quickly follows. The hunters inside don't follow, and Ethan realizes this just as he runs into their allies, a pair of archers. One of them wields a crossbow, while the other has a classic bow with some technology where the, at, the holden, at the holden point where the handle is. The handle is what you would call that, Ben. But both of their arrows glow a pale technological blue. Whatever tricks you used in the arena, one of them says, it won't save you here. And suddenly both men pitch forward as they are impacted from behind. Blood spurts from their mouths, bah, as they fall. They hit the ground dead revealing a double-bladed axe in the head of each man. A massive shadow steps out from underneath a stone arch, and he is a biggin'. This being is the same one that was watching our boys at the end of last issue. Thanks to the shadows from his cloak, we can only see a portion of his face and body. His face is wide, with a short nose tucked up just under his blue eyes. A silver spike is pierced through his left eyebrow, and he has two silver studs that are set into the sides of his lower jaw. Wouldn't do to have them get you, he says, pulling his axes out of the corpses. Or the ones inside, implying that he's finished off those that Ethan was running from. The hunter returns one of the axes to his holding mechanism on his back, and it clicks in place. This being may have saved Ethan, but he keeps his sword trained on him the whole time. Are you with the underground? He asks warily. The hunter stares him down. The underground. Yes. Ethan then lowers the sword. Look, I already told Ashley, he starts to say. Skink tries to warn Ethan not to lower his guard, but it is too late. A fist the size of Ethan's face smashes into Ethan's face. As he falls backward, the hunter dashes in and grabs Ethan's shirt. He normally only brings in corpses but Braun wants this one alive. <laughs> Imagine what he has planned for you. Skink cries out a battle yell and charges forward, but the hunter just swats him aside without a care. He looks back at Ethan. After winning the tournament, he thought that this kid would be some kind of warrior. How disappointing. From behind, a dark shadow falls over the hunter's body. The sound of moving stone starts small at first, and then he twists, just in time to have a stone wall collapse on him. Ethan saw it coming and managed to roll away, dodging most of the debris. He peers through the dust. What happened just now? The dust settles a bit, revealing Skink holding a medium-sized piece of tree in his arms. He knocked the wall over with it. Ethan thanks him for the save, gathers up his sword, and then Skink suggests that they leave this place. Yeah. Seems like a smart move. Mars opens this issue a little differently than the last three issues. Those issues all started pretty slow, introducing our characters and our concepts, and then ultimately building to an action-based climax, like Ethan scarring Braun, Braun wounding Ethan, or Ethan and Braun confronting each other at the waterfall. But this issue actually opens on a fight scene, with Ethan already handling some bounty hunters. This is a welcome change of pace, as Mars doesn't want these issues to get too similar. After all, three of those climaxes that I mentioned are all Ethan versus Braun. This formula could get very old very quickly if Mars isn't careful. But he is careful, and so he changes things up. After opening with some action, we'll probably get some quiet time, and then we will most likely end on an action scene with some sort of cliffhanger. We actually saw Chris Claremont do this a couple times in Fantastic Four Volume 3 as well. It helps to break up the flow of issues and how the writer approaches their story. Remember, CrossGen is writing specifically for the trade paperback, so the idea here is that not only can you read this as a singular monthly issue, but that if you sit down with your nice seven-issue trade paperback and you read it in one go, it should be like reading a book. So it's important that the story ebbs and flows properly even within each chapter. Despite this shakeup, Ethan handles a group of enemies pretty easily, and, honestly, this is something that's starting to bug me a little bit. Now, we don't know too much about Ethan's past and how much work he has done with a sword before. We were told that Ethan had been training for the tournament, and, given that he is part of the royal family, he probably had access to the best trainers that the Heron dynasty could find. 
it is totally possible that Ethan is a very well-trained fighter, even if he is an experienced one. But we have seen him go up against Brawn and won, and admittedly that was due to the extra power lent by the Sigil, but since that fight, he's fought a trio of bounty hunters in last issue, and now he fights another three of them in these ruins. And these are bounty hunters. These aren't citizens who just happen to find Ethan. They are skilled. They are experienced. They should have the upper hand in all of these fights. But Ethan easily disarms or wounds them. They could just be cocky. Ethan is only 21, and the Raven Lands might think that the Herons are soft or stupid or just not good swordsmen. There could be any kind of societal judgment that allows them to underestimate Ethan. And this group does prepare for a possible escape, which is nice, it just doesn't work out how they hoped. As an audience member, we know from the end of last issue that this lesser race member is a bounty hunter from the second that we see him. His first line in the comic was easy money, so yeah, this guy's gotta be a bounty hunter. But Ethan doesn't know that yet. He sees a lesser race member helping him, and he automatically assumes that they're with the underground. I love how the hunter didn't even know that going into this. He just agrees when Ethan asks if he's with the underground. This tells us that this guy is physically strong, he is intelligently cunning, and he is willing to take advantage of Ethan's blunders. We also know that he is cold-blooded. He not only kills those two archers, but he says that he killed the rest of the bounty hunters. He didn't have to do that. He could have tricked Ethan into escaping and led him into a trap, or he could have waited until Ethan went to sleep or something and then spared the other hunters. But why bother? They're competition at best, enemies at worst, and they're better off dead because of it. And the hunter tells us that he normally brings in corpses, so he has killed before. This guy is a legitimate threat. Or at least, he was until Skink knocked a wall over on him. Surprisingly nice job, Skink. Overall, this is a fast-paced, action-filled opening sequence. It really only just hit me how stupid it is to have glowing weapons as a bounty hunter. Like, we see a man with a sword, a woman with a spear, another man with, like, crescent-shaped blades that curve around the knuckles, uh, and then we have our archers, and they all have glowing weapons. How are you supposed to sneak around at night and hunt people if you're Goram glowing in the dark? This lesser racer hunter just has... Axes. Good old-fashioned head-chopping axes, baby. That is how you stealth, son. And he is far more effective because of it. After some time, Ethan and Skink have put some distance between themselves and the ruins, and Ethan finally feels comfortable to talk. He knew that they were being hunted, but when he saw that bounty hunter was of the lesser races, he just assumed that he was with the underground. He's going to need to be more careful if they're going to get home. Anyone could have done the same, Skink assures him. Anyone who was thinking too much about the underground could have done the same, Ethan argues back. He's been beating himself up for turning Ashley down, but... But he had to. Skink understands why he did it, right? Skink dodges the question, saying that he understands that Ethan has a lot of responsibilities to deal with. He didn't ask for any of this, but his destiny is no longer his own. Ethan looks at his sigil. You mean this thing? Whatever it does, it somehow seems to have healed his face. It sure did change his life, but it's not like he has any better understanding of what it is or how he got it now. It is whatever you make of it, Skink says wisely. A gift or a curse. It might just be the thing to make a difference in this looming war, Ethan says. Although that means that they still need to steal a boat, cross the ocean, get home safely, and do it all in time to warn his family. And that's a lot to hope for. Ethan wavers once again. It is the right thing to do, right? Going home to stop the war? What Skink thinks... doesn't matter. The only thing that does matter is that Ethan does what he thinks is right. Skink then recounts a story of when Ethan was maybe seven or eight. That winter, his father's prize stallion got loose during a snowstorm. Despite having been forbidden to do so, Ethan went out after it. 
he was gone for a day and a night, and no one thought that he could possibly have survived. But he returned. And when he did, he was riding that stallion. Inspired, Ethan claps a hand on Skink's shoulder, thanking him. Skink has always been there for him. He only hopes that Skink knows how much he means to him. Skink ends this scene by saying that he has always watched over Ethan. And he always will. We open this scene with Ethan kicking himself over trusting the bounty hunter, and I totally buy that emotional reaction. Ethan has been written as a pretty serious guy, so it makes sense that his mistake would bother him. It also solidifies the idea that Ethan isn't over the Underground's cause. He's decided to go home because he feels that he has to, but there is a justice to the Underground's mission that he can't deny, either. Despite making his decision, Ethan isn't 100% comfortable with it, and so he goes to Skink for reassurance. And, like last issue, Skink dodges his own thoughts or opinions, and at this point, I'm getting pretty sick of that. Skink might be Ethan's sidekick, but he's also our only other cast member at this point, and he has no personality other than being subservient to Ethan, uh, loyal to Ethan, and concerned with, take a wild guess who I'm going to name here, never mind, I'm going to tell you, it's Ethan! Grow a personality, man, you are stiff as a board. Now, Skink does relate the story about when Ethan was a child, which is a cute story that demonstrates that Ethan does what he thinks he has to, no matter what. It doesn't matter that he was forbidden for searching, it doesn't matter how dangerous it could have been, Ethan chose to do it anyway, and it worked out. Skink is telling Ethan to do what he thinks is right, and everything will work out fine. Which Ethan needs to hear, as he's vacillating between warning his family or helping the lesser races. Either cause is a good one, but whichever one that he picks, Ethan needs to commit, or he'll keep making mistakes like the one he made with the bounty hunter. A cold mist covers the landscape as Ethan and Skink greet the gray morning. Ethan is pretty sure that they should be coming up on a town soon. Then he'll have to find a hoverboat, steal it, and cross the great sea. Oh. No. Our boys stand upon a grassy ridge, looking down on a small town. Army tents are set up on the beach, with smaller craft drifting in the waves near the beach and long wooden docks. Farther out in the water are much larger ships, like 13 battleships. This is the Raven Fleet, and they are prepared for war. Shocked, but kinda not shocked, Ethan reasons that the Ravens must have been preparing this fleet for some time. There's no way that they could have gathered the forces and supplies to do this in a few days since the tournament. His mission to return home just got dialed up to a floop at eleven, let's go, Skink! The pair make their way down the hill, going unseen thanks to the mist. Skink acts as a distraction, allowing Ethan to ambush a slacking guard. Despite downing that guy quickly, another guard spots him and asks his business. Ethan kicks him in the head, scattering his paperwork into the air. What's your business? With the flick of a wrist, Ethan catches one of the sheets of paper in midair, and he looks over it. It's the invasion plans. The size of the fleet, the landing location, everything. They need to get this information back home. Ethan tells Skink to get into the boarding craft while he shuts off the magnetic moorings, but suddenly a double-bladed axe slams into the mooring, disabling it. The bounty hunter looms over Ethan again. I am much harder to kill than that. But now he's changed his mind about bringing Ethan in alive. Killing him will be easy. They begin to fight, with the hunter's blows smashing through the dock when Ethan dodges. As they do, the unmoored craft with Skink in it starts to float away. Skink calls for Ethan, and he jumps, barely managing to grab a hold of the side of it. He and Skink then manage to transfer to a larger boat, which has wide wings sticking off of the back, where the hover tech seems to be. It's like right above the level of water. The hunter leaps from the dock and lands in the boarding craft, but it shatters under his weight. For a moment, it looks like he might drown, but then the hunter bursts from the water, swinging his double-bladed axe wildly. Ethan dodges as the hunter rants, I have never lost a bounty! And then Ethan dives at him. His family needs him, and Ethan won't fail them now. His sword plunges to the hilt inside of the hunter's chest. It literally sticks out of his back. 
They separate, Ethan pulling his sword out as the dazed hunter backs away. Then he goes over the side of the boat. The hunter falls into the water. And this time, he doesn't come back up. Ethan steps back once more as his adrenaline dies down. What he's just done really hits him for the first time. That's... he's... he's the first person that Ethan ever killed. Don't worry, Skink says. It'll be okay, Ethan. We're finally going home. So before I go into my final thoughts for this scene, I want to comment on the artwork. Because the artwork in Scion is good. Again, it's just top-notch stuff. Easily some of the best-looking comics that I've seen in my life. Even now, looking back at this book that's 21 years old, it is still gorgeous. And since this issue takes place largely at night and in the early morning, it is also mostly cooler colors, lots of blues and grays. They even printed the comics on blue-tinted pages, so the gutters that frame our panels are all blue, making everything appear darker. It's awesome, and I love it, but it is also a good way to drown the audience in a color palette, you know what I'm saying? I'm blue and I'm a dee, I'm a die. am I right? But colorist Cesar Rodriguez adds lots of green and silver highlights to the grass that Ethan and Skink walk on, making it look A, lit by moonlight, which is dope, and B, it also help add some pop to these pages, so not everything is this dark shade of color. Then, as Ethan and Skink sneak into town and try to steal a ship, there's an ever-present fog hanging over the panels. It's not just gray or like a full white cloud, it's opaque, it hugs the ground. In the two-page spread where Ethan and Skink look out over the water, which, gorgeous, oh my god, uh, we can see multiple levels of ground that lead down to the town and the beach, and the mist gathers along each level. I have lived these kinds of cold, gray, damp mornings. I can practically smell the dew in the air. This is amazing to me. The mist also serves the purpose of allowing Ethan and Skink to pass their stealth checks with advantage, as does our bounty hunter. And it's no secret that this dude is tenacious. He had a walk wall, he had a rock wall dropped on him, he dug himself out, and then he tracked his quarry through the night and managed to sneak up on Ethan again. This dude is for real. But now he's angry, and he lets that anger drive him through the fight, making stupid mistakes. Ethan has shown himself to be fast, he escaped the other hunters at the start of the issue, and our boys made it to the sea in basically one night of walking. And the hunter does try to trap him. He hits that mooring, allowing Skink's boat to float away, and hopefully that would trap Ethan on the dock. But then Ethan jumps for it and makes it, forcing our dude to give chase. And this guy is just not built for water. This guy is shaped like Thanos. He is a walking tank, and he has these two massive battle axes with him. The boat shatters under him, dunking him, and sure, he climbs aboard the second boat, but now he's pissed. Now he's stupid. Now he rushes in, giving Ethan a chance to land a critical strike. And down he goes. And now Ethan has to live with that. Remember, it was probably less than a week ago that Ethan got into his first real sword fight, and even that was under the pretense of the tournament. No one was supposed to die there, much less get hurt. Sure, he has wounded some of the other bounty hunters who have chased him, but he's also never aimed to kill them. Wound them? Sure. Disarm them? Always. But only with the goal of escape in mind. Even when he sets out to steal this boat, he doesn't kill anyone. He just knocks them out. Ethan is not a killer, he's not a madman, he doesn't even really hate the Raven people, he just can't let himself be captured. But this lesser racist dude, he just doesn't quit. As Skink helps Ethan onto the second boat in mid-combat, Ethan even comments that this guy seems unstoppable. So what else could he do? They have the invasion plans, they have a boat, they need to get home. Ethan can't let anything stop him. Not his sympathies for the underground, or this bounty hunter. So he kills him. We don't spend a lot of time on that idea in this issue, as, obviously, it happens right at the end. But Mars doesn't make this feel like a triumphant moment where the hero finally accomplishes his goal and kills the bad guy. This kind of feels like a loss. 
Like, Ethan barely makes it, and only then it's by doing something that he has never done before. Ethan killed a guy. Although, with war looming on the horizon, this bounty hunter might not be the last person that he kills. Next time, Ethan's journey takes him across the Great Sea, but it is not smooth sailing as a massive storm bars the way. And even if Ethan manages to make it home, there's still an invasion fleet close behind. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 18.3, Scion. It's not your fault. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening.